I like to say that the individual is a lethal fiction, which is a play on the idea that the individual is a legal fiction. It is interesting that we call uh, corporations legal fictions. Uh, but the reason that I say that the individual is a lethal fiction, or that I like to sometimes say that, is a bit more complicated. And it has to do with the difference between an authentically intelligent human collective that those people live, invent, sustain, and themselves made and voluntarily joined with and asked. Uh, the difference between an authentic collective and a fictional one. So it kind of matters what an individual is kind of matters. Uh, or rather, it depends upon uh, the nature of the context in which we make them a member, whether by word or in truth or living or whatever. So that um, the idea of an individual just as an abstract thing is a deadly fiction. There's no such thing. You've never seen one. There's no person that is themselves by themselves. They didn't become themselves by themselves. They didn't make themselves, feed themselves, grow a mind in isolation, and so on. Um, there is no such thing as an individual. All of us are in what we refer to as culture, and that is in what we refer to as nature, whether we like to pretend that that's true or not. So, what is an individual? Is there such a thing? And what does it mean to be or have a self? <clears throat> uh, we are trained to think and speak as though we as individuals possess certain traits, qualities that can be analyzed, skill, intelligence, uh, weight, height, beauty, athletic facility, and so on. And in a culture that has become dominated by the analytical paradigm, and the promise of making it a kind of a universal thing in every dimension of our lives, especially in the cities, uh, we're playing with a lot of very dangerous material that I think we don't understand the psychological and human and ecological effects of. But how do we figure out what it means to be an, an individual? What if, what if someone doesn't know? What if someone said, well, I don't know what it means to be an individual. Help me understand what you mean by this word. What if someone who came from a place where everyone was always together, and even when they weren't, they still kind of were, so that none of them really thought of themselves as individuals, but rather as, um, well, appendages. Yeah, like my hand is of me. Yeah. So they all thought of themselves as the appendage of a, not thought of, but knew themselves this way, and so didn't know what we meant by an individual. What, what could we tell them? A separate person. Really, that sounds terrifying. So they would think of chopping off one of the fingers and then asking yourself questions about what it would think and do and what kinds of qualities it would have by itself, right? And that to those people would seem absurd. And what I'd like us to consider together is that uh, we truly are like those people in my figure that can only be individuals within an authentic context that is humane um, and ecologically and relationally intelligent, self-correcting, uh, 
that breaks up and comes back together and doesn't just play one song over and over, right? So we have the idea of an individual and that idea is a fiction. Even though it's a physical fact that you are separate and since you belong to no authentic collective other than your friends and family and such, probably, maybe you do, you will not be protected or sustained or known as one of. You will not be seen as, ah, you are of us, which is perhaps one of the most in, important experiences for human beings to have, to belong. And not to belong provisionally or by contract, by obligation, by law, by necessity or by birth. Not, not to belong by random facts or by, um, how should we put it, compulsion. Yeah? But to belong in truth and to be a full member, to have agency and meaning in endeavors and teams and groups, families, tribes that matter and are real and are not led by fictions and are not based on what we consume together. Uh, be that be, you know, sports, drugs, religious fictions, um, scientific paradigms, the newest philosophy of unity on the market, transcendence, ascension, near-death experience, you, you name it, right? We find a million kind of ways to come together and exchange wild, wilder fictions, uh, but none of our fundamental communities are authentic. And so... We hear a lot of talk about people think this, people do that. Um, these people think this way, those people think that way. Meanwhile, there's nothing underneath all those people that's, uh, how should we put it, true, that we can trust. That we can trust ecologically, right, in the sense of life on earth. That we can trust as animals in the sense that it's not deadly poisonous to animals, because we're animals. And in the sense of humanity, in that it's human and doesn't put fictions over lives and intelligence, and doesn't put technology over lives and intelligence, and doesn't put ideas over lives and intelligence, but keeps those lives and intelligences first. Yeah? Sees relation first and frameworks third or something, right? So we've kind of got the opposite of that pretty much everywhere. So that even the people who embody the agents of false collectives are doubly or triply false within them. Thus, uh, our police aren't police, our government, <laughs> our governors are not governors, um, our political system isn't a political system, our Christianity isn't Christianity. Our feminism isn't feminism. <laughs> I mean, it's just everything instantly uh, kind of counterfeits itself <laughs> the moment that we start trying to collect around a topic because our fundamental connection is missing or counterfeited, fictional. The fact that we are all Americans, quote unquote, because we happen to have... Uh, we happen to live on this continent at this moment in time <clears throat> together with fictionally drawn boundaries and such. And, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of a massive cluster fork of competing fictions. And then we have some mask in that. Yeah. And that mask is our individuality that we're supposed to defend and celebrate, advertise, protect, and so on, I guess, or something. Therapy is really cool because it's about the relationship between the mask and all the fictional overlays. So that's kind of crazy. The idea of therapy is that you can fix the mask so that it won't so severely conflict with all those fictions that you can't survive it anymore. That's interesting. <laughs> and so you're going you're to have to go work in those fictions to make the money, to pay for the therapy, to adjust your mask so that it won't conflict so much with the fictions you have to work to pay the therapist for <laughs> that you can't survive it. That sounds like a great idea. So anyway, we have all these overlays, right? We're, we're living in a real um, biological world 
And then because we're representational animals, we have all these fictional overlays. And um, we've always, you know, had some. And we've got a lot more today, especially with the onset of the, quote, information age. We've, we keep making new layers, right? Uh, stratified layers of cultural overlays, um, representational schemas, systems, ideas, algorithms, um, sciences, religions, philosophies, and so on. Uh, traditions. So the individual, how does it exist? In, it, since it's buried in all those overlays and swarming, it's, all those things are swarming all around it. I mean, you couldn't stop naming all the different fictions. You, you wouldn't be able to get done, even for that a child is exposed to, right? And so what are they exposed to that we can trust? Huh? Well, in the human world, very, very little. Because again, they're not going to have a basis to stand on from which to be able to reliably interpret it. Yeah? So without that basis, even books of great intelligence, even mathematics, even uh, the arts, even the sciences um, become dangerous. Because what's the basis that, that from which we'll, we'll approach these things for what purposes? Yeah? And what's going to happen is they're always going to be the purposes of the overlays and the fictional culture and such. <clears throat> Therefore, we're not going to be able to trust them. They're going to be internally conflicted and this and that. Uh, so the individual has the same problem with trying to figure out who, who he or she is, who they are. Yeah? And uh, in, in a million overlays are conflicting with it. So there's actually kind of no way to be an individual. You know, you're going to decide what you'll do and what you won't do within the overlays and you'll kind of wear those clothes and talk that talk and do those things and belong to, you know, a group of friends and uh, people who think like you, maybe. And perhaps you'll include a few people who don't think quite exactly like you, but close enough that you don't have to fight and uh, something like that. Huh? But that's not individuality. <laughs> That's actually something very confusing and different. So it looks like in order to have individuals, you have to have authentic cultures, or at least um, <clears throat> a collection of people who've come together authentically and intelligently, not to agree with each other or celebrate each other or aggrandize each other, but to, to learn, to see, and to grow, and maybe to accomplish a very important task. Um, there are examples of such collectives, they're, they're uncommon, but they can also spring up at random when there's a problem. Sometimes we form them fluidly, and for a brief moment, inside those collectives, real human individuals emerge, actual people. But most of the time it's impossible for us to be individuals because we need a context that encourages the full dimensionality of what it means to be human and alive and intelligent. And because most of the contexts have 90% of those options shut off and the remaining 10% counterfeited, we aren't individuals. <laughs> We're depersonated. We've been depersonated and we'll kind of grab onto whatever sort of little pieces of personation-like representations we can get from the overlays, you know, and can tattoo those on ourselves and advertise them to the world and such. And to try and have some sense of uh, our own, the spirit of our personation into life and intelligence, awareness, consciousness, dreaming, love, discovery, mutual rescue, wonder, nature. Yeah. So there are all the people that we talk about, most people and all this kind of thing. They're kind of proto-people because we don't know what they would do in a context that was real. They might not act anything like that. Criminals and reprobates, um, crazy insane Republicans, uh, flippy, dippy, hippie kind of, you know, whatever you want to make up names for people and call them, however you want to diminish them or classify them. <clears throat> the really weird thing is, and all of the times we say, like, most people this, those people that, we're really, we're not talking about people at all. We're talking about 
first of all, just an idea in our minds of what we think, you know, thought people. So these aren't actually really people at all we're talking about. But we're thinking about um, people that have no context, like people decontexted people, right? People in general. But everybody is different in different contexts. And we can invent and change all those contexts together. We're not just subject to contexts, even though uh, language in our tradition of expectation perhaps inclines us in this direction. No, we are capable of transforming any context instantaneously. Uh, we are the ones who generate the reference frame, its purposive anchors, its, its orientations, all these things. And a single person can transform <laughs> A planet can, can transform the context of the planet uh, if they, how should we put it, have the right relational senses at, in play. Yeah? Uh, because what most people are doing is reacting to joining and objecting and fighting for and against a bunch of pieces of the overlay. And this will never succeed, unfortunately. It will generate more overlay, as anyone should see. So we have to make a kind of different move. We have to make a move in a different dimension. We have to establish contexts in which we can personate authentically together, which we won't depersonate each other, and in which we won't be made to impersonate half-human versions of things we never wanted to be, in contexts that are so conflicted that we can't even do that correctly. Um, <clears throat> so I think what, what an individual starts to look like is somebody in a constellation of meaningful, intelligent relationships with nature, other people, purpose, learning, skill, play, uh, creativity, right? An individual, really, you're going to need something like that to ever see what one looks like. And so if you're looking at any person who's not looking like that, not looking like a member of a, of a rich constellation, a vitally human, vitally ecologically relational, intelligent people, you know, heartful, creative, uh, curious, learning oriented, these are people who will not value opinions much and will probably not have a lot of beliefs. Yeah. These are people so quickly learning that they flow through change. Uh, they transform rapidly, learn very quickly together. Um, when those kind, if you're if you're seeing someone in that kind of a context, now you've got in something like an individual. But if you take any person and and make any of those relationships fake or give them precedences from the culture, fictions, jobs, money, economy, drugs, and so on, sex, whatever it takes. To corrupt it. Now you're getting much less of an individual, and as the entire context gets counterfeited seven ways to Sunday, what you have is, is sort of the victim of that. <clears throat> Any remaining individuality in there is thin and heroic, <laughs> uh, unless you've got a very unusual person who can resist or even, how should we put it, manipulate the overlays. And then there are those whose humanity is so deep and strong that they can just stand above them, yeah, in all cases. Uh, those kinds of individuals are rare. There are a few of them. But even those people are deeply, deeply in love uh, with nature and humanity, intelligence, liber the, the, the origins that become the word we've shamed as liberty, and um, other such matters. Yeah. So I don't think we're individuals until we invent contexts in which we can intelligently become them. And we do that in places in culture. It's not like there are none. Um, one imagines uh, a quintet um, playing in the afternoon uh, in an urban center, uh, perhaps original classical music, or one imagines a moment where people have come together and there's some kind of culture jamming, 
going on. Yeah, they're kind of hacking the culture and transforming the space into intelligence and play together unexpectedly. <clears throat> um, there are classrooms where something more like the origins of learning together is going on. There are rare shining students who can transform a who can bring an entire classroom back to life. Yeah? And so too, uh, there are teachers, but even those students and those teachers are members of the constellation. And it's the constellation that you're seeing when it appears that an individual is shining. Yeah? So are there individuals? Do, do we really have distinct minds, right? Well, that's an interesting question. Is your mind the same if I put someone else with you, right? Anyone else. And will it change depending on who that person is? Huh? So is it true that you have a mind, right? That you have a mind that has certain qualities that you can depend on these qualities as language and tradition uh, like us to think? Is it true that you've got a mind? And not only that, who, if it, if it were true that you have a mind, like, like we say in English, which sounds ridiculous, who is it that, that is the possessor? Because it imi it, that implies that something that is not your mind is you and possesses a mind as like an extra feature. But is that true? Would that make any sense? So <laughs> let's just say that, um, uh, for example, you are comatose. And so, let's also say that you're never going to wake up, <clears throat> in this case, not you, but let's say that some person in a thought experiment is comatose, and they're never going to wake up. Are they a you? Now, if they wake up, they are a you, they have a mind. But if they don't wake up, are they still, what kind of a, what is the status of the self there? It's highly theoretical, whatever it is, because we won't be able to ask them. We'll have to wonder from outside, right? So... Um, we're going to probably have to just make stuff up. And we might not be entirely wrong about all the things we make up, but we should, neither should we depend on them very, very much, for we cannot check. So do you have a mind? And if I put you in a battleground, do you have the mind that you have if I put you in a boring classroom? Is that the same mind that you have if I put you in the most amazing moment in a classroom you've ever had? Is it the same mind you have when you're doing something you like, or when you're doing something you don't like, do you have a mind? And if there are animals nearby, do you have the same mind? What if there is a bee? What if there is, you know, a bird? What if there is a tiger? So, not only that, did you get a mind by yourself? And do you only think about you in your mind? So, do you never think about other situations, animals, people, blah, blah, blah? Because if you think about other people, or if you think about, for example, some people have an unfortunate problem with this, if you think about how other people may be thinking of you, uh-oh, then you realize that <clears throat> your mind is really interested in other minds, and other people, and maybe even animals and living places and machines that simulate them and all, all kinds of things. And that's probably because you don't just have one. Maybe what you're doing isn't like having. Maybe, although your mind and your habits with it tend to look stable in a certain way to your history, over history and such, right? Uh, maybe there's a lot more there than meets the eye of our language and thinking. I'd like to suggest there is. So I think what happens is more than we have a mind is that we compose minds together in contexts according to what is proximate to our attention and urgent uh, to our desire and stuff. Um, so I think we sort of keep assembling different kinds of minds on the fly. And we have habits about how we do that that are personal, but the potentials of each person are fairly unlimited in the right kinds of contexts where uh, cooperation co or cooperative competition even is the norm rather than uh, focus on individuals uh, which is our 
the way we tend to approach it. So I don't think we have minds. I think our minds are a constellation of relationships and histories that are really very elaborate and change dramatically in different contexts. And by the way, they change in a certain way under analysis, um, so that whenever we're trying to analyze those minds, we're going to get kind of weird results, even if the minds don't know they're being analyzed. And analysis itself produces um, a rather disembodied perspective to begin with, that while useful in its narrow fields of application, becomes a bit confusing and tyrannical when it escapes them. Now, before I close, I'm going to touch briefly on the question of what could a soul be? What is the intellect? What is that with which you can tell whether something is true or not, whether it is beautiful or not, whether you like it or not, whether you recognize it or not. What is it, what is that with which you laugh when a joke gets through to you? <laughs> what is that which makes you cry when uh, deep feelings are aroused? And what is meant by this idea of a soul? Could you have a soul? And, and might it be something you could lose, right? Or could it be threatened? Or could it be rewarded? Hmm. Yeah. So now if you have a soul, like if you have individuality, which again, I think we've seen is really kind of a questionable idea, although it's you've got physical individuality, that's deceptive compared to our human nature and the real situation of relation on earth for organisms and people with hearts and minds. So, so do we have a separate soul? Now, if we do, then, of course, it can be threatened and we can be told there are rewards for it and such like that. We can be told it can live eternally or maybe perish or possibly be tormented, rewarded, and so on. But what if we don't? What if? What if we, what if our soul is a constellation of other lives? And our position of reference to that constellation. So, it's obviously a constellation. I have a specific link to every organism on this planet. And so do you. And that's probably the most fundamental identity that I have in truth. The most trustworthy, absolutely true fact about who and what I am. <clears throat> I have a connection to every animal on the earth, every ecology. And then I have a specific connection to every human being in all of human history. And then I have um, closer and closer rings of connection until you get a very small constellation of those people who've been close to my life, who I've impacted, so to speak, or who I've, who my um, existence has informed, and whose existence has informed mine. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so too, I have relationships with temporal situations, contexts, moments. I have a specific temporal relationship to every moment in terrestrial history, at least. But um, when we start getting close to the people and the animals and the living environments that I uh, have emerged with and from and as, we start to understand something about my soul. My soul is the living places and beings and relationships in whom I have brought soul into and, and who have brought soul into me. So it's not something that I have, right? Uh, it's more something that I express. Um, the index finger of a hand doesn't have its own soul. What the hand is used for and does expresses the soul of the index finger, yeah? So, like, I don't, I don't really... Though I can understand and, and very much identify with the idea of a separate soul, because I'm a regular person raised in, in Western America, everything I see in nature implies something else. 
and not just in nature, um, things I've seen beyond <laughs> nature too, very clearly seem to imply that a soul is a way of being in and as relation, and it is also something like a way of travel in and as relation, and it depends upon the relationships closest to one's own heart, origin, life, places, the animals, and so on. Um, so for me, it's a changing constellation, and it's really the whole history of life on Earth, but if you want to get, you know, close to me, um, my little portion of that, so to speak, it doesn't belong to me. Indeed, what I have over it is a uh, conservatorship. I have been blessed in, in, my, in, in my toy that I'm making here with the capacity to invent and enact soulfulness as Darren. Um, in a milieu so exotically beautiful, so incredibly alive and true, that such an opportunity is an unimaginable grace. And though in my regular human thinking and you know relation with the with culture and the overlays and the internet and jobs and fear and such, I forget all of that. Uh, fundamentally. I sense that um, a soul is something we are doing and not something we possess. And so that I do not have one, I become one. Or not I become one, I become, <laughs> what is the right word? It's not a one. I become the flowing of soul or something like this, yeah? Uh, I'm, uh, forgive me, my, my words are failing failing me at the moment, and um, that's probably appropriate when speaking of such matters. But what I'm trying to get at is just that uh, it is a capacity of agency that's local to my mind and life, rather than a possession that will, that I have now or will depart or can be tortured or preserved. Well, no, it's a pattern in a vast web of relationships, yes? And so I can't have that any more than a drop can have the, a droplet of water can have the ocean, right? Um, and there's another very significant facet of this idea, which is similarly true of the intellect. We imagine that they are local, stuck inside us, a possession. They are nothing like this. They are vehicles for travel. And there is a dimension in which the intellect can travel that is alive and itself more than intelligent. And the same is true of the soul. The soul's dimension is nature. Um, it is meant to fly. It is a flying part of you. And so too the intellect. But these matters are much more complex. We'll leave them for another time. Perhaps for the moment, I've at least brought into question how we t tend to think about people, right? Because they don't tend to become people until you give them a context in which they can authentically personate, yeah? Uh, so they're kind of in a proto-state until then, and we have to make that context. And how we are depersonated and then must impersonate people and how it's not going to work, how therapy is a little bit weird about that. Um, and then the intellect, yeah? Uh, that with which we represent and think and use language, right? and how this and ideas from the intellect tend to stand over our intelligence and form cultural overlays and bury us in all of that. So it's really hard to uh, discover who to be, what, how to be, what to be. Um, and then finally, the soul. Right? We don't possess it, but it is actually related to how we are in relation. Yeah. And thus you don't have one that's getting stained or marked or counted. Uh, it is a way of being or not. You know, being some other way, which definitely can become accounting uh, and, and likely to do so. And perhaps we've raised some questions about um, the, possession, the possession aspect of... Uh, 
qualities, right? The qualities are associated with people when really it's kinds of potential and most of it remains hidden until there's a context appropriate for it to emerge. Until then, what will we see? I don't know, symptoms of its absence? If we think those are people, we ourselves have become quite confused. Perhaps by creating contexts that are authentic, challenging, mutual, um, cooperatively competitive, and uh, ecologically intimate, we will have a chance to discover what it might mean to be an individual uh, and what it might mean to be a part of a collective that uh, was noble and true enough to stand in violation of nearly everything else we've seen, again, with, with few and wonderful exceptions. Perhaps we'll find ways to become more of those together. Thanks.